This is Evan Marquette, dating coach for smart, strong, successful women, and your personal trainer for love. Welcome back to the Love You Podcast. This is a place where you're going to learn everything you need to know about dating relationships, men and sex, from a man's point of view. And today, we are talking about how to avoid a bad relationship before it happens. Now, I am no Nostradamus. Uh, I, I'm not going to tell you how to uh, keenly predict the future devoid of any context. Um, but I am going to share some information with you about, uh, personally, some of my bad relationships and, more importantly, other people's bad relationships. And, and we're going to show you how they apply to you so you can avoid making some of the mistakes that you've made in the past, uh, overlooking signs that uh, your relationship is headed for a big brick wall. Your own way disappeared um, something. Uh, I've written lots of things, but uh, only a handful of things that, that, that have really stuck with me that, that I feel that are, are particularly worth repeating. And one of them is that you can't read the last page of the book before you read the book. And in general, that's something that I believe. Um, uh, it's very dangerous to start dating someone new and uh, you're on your first date and you're thinking about the future and what kind of husband he's going to be and what your, kind of, what your kids are going to look like and whether he's going to be able to financially support you if you quit your job when you have kids. and. I, you could you can drive yourself crazy trying to look too for, too far into the future too soon, um, but that doesn't mean that that there aren't signs when you're dating someone of what your future might look like. So those are sort of two different things that sort of sound like they contradict each other, but they don't. On one hand, I'm telling you, don't get too excited, right? Don't get ahead of where you are, and at the same time, I'm saying, you know, pay attention to what's in front of you, pay attention to the evidence at hand. And you can get a sense of, the, of the, the end of the book without reading the book just by reading the first few chapters very often. So in 2000, um, I was written to on Match.com by a woman who didn't have a photo. Uh, she was easily the most be beautiful woman that had ever written to me on online. And as it turns out, uh, uh, one of the most probably the most beautiful woman I ever uh, dated. Uh, I'm not going to refer to her by by name uh, because I don't think the story makes her look good. It doesn't make me look good. Nobody really looks good when you talk about you know, relationships that have gone awry. Um, but we, we went out for drinks and dinner on La Brea Avenue here in Los Angeles. Uh, I, I was going to take her out dancing afterwards. And I remember something distinctly about the date, um, and that was that uh, she, I started talking about my dad, who'd passed away a, a year before, and I started crying on the date, which I thought was an unusual thing to do. And it, it didn't scare her away. It actually made her feel closer to me. I don't recommend this as a strategy, by the way. I'm just saying it was a very real, authentic, vulnerable moment that ended up with dinner, dancing, and then back to my place. After which she told me, she didn't want to be in a relationship with me. I was one of five guys she was dating. Um, she just wanted to see how things would play out. She's always been in relationships, and she wanted to keep her options open. And I said, all right, you do your thing, uh, but here's what I will tell you. Uh, if you're going out with those other five guys, um, the next time you go out with one of them and you find yourself thinking of me, uh, that should be the last time you see him. And when you're done with all the other guys, then I will be your boyfriend. Um, I was a little cocky back in my late 20s. And that's actually what happened. About three weeks later, she became my, my girlfriend. Um, she lived about an hour from me, so it was sort of a long-distance relationship. She was unemployed, um, uh, living with her mom. I had to drive a long distance to be with her. She couldn't afford anything. And when we were good, which was 75% of the time, we were really good. I think she 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 had a she had a big heart. She knew how to have fun. Uh, she was reasonably bright. Um, yeah, there was she had a, a pretty good sense of humor. But, but, um, there was a side of her, and again, I don't want to sound like I'm issuing blame, that had a very hard time with communication. And the first instance I saw of this was, we I took her to a friend's wedding. It was in Catalina Island, which is about an hour off the, the coast of Long Beach. It was, it was a, a big deal. It was the first event we were attending together, and she spent a lot of time looking for the proper wedding dress. Um, not the wedding dress, the a dress to wear to this wedding. She didn't know anybody. I didn't really know anybody at this wedding either, except for the bride and groom. So she's like, I can't wear white, and it's a Sunday day, so I can't wear black, and it's, uh, you know, I want, don't want to upstage the bride, so I shouldn't wear red. And so she's really going through all these machinations to try to choose the right dress. And I'm just a dude. I don't know anything about anything. And she, one day she shows me, here's the dress I bought. It was the silky lavender number, and I was like, 
great, it's a beautiful dress. I'm sure you're gonna look lovely. So we go to Catalina Island. We, we, we are the last people to step into the, uh, the, the chapel or you know, wherever they, they got married. And sure enough, my girlfriend's dress is the exact same as all the bridesmaids' dresses. And so I had the only reaction that I could possibly have, which is that I, I, I laughed because it was funny. Um, she didn't feel that this was funny. In fact, she felt this was the worst thing in the world, given how hard she looked for a dress. She was so terribly embarrassed. And the fact that I laughed meant that I was, I was a, a, a terrible boyfriend who had, had no sensitivity to her feelings. And, and she started like a, a thing, like a big fight right there. As soon as they got married, she, 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 she ran out of the chapel and we got into like a, you know, a fight and there was crying. And then she left the wedding. Just up, up and left the wedding in this, you know, a destination wedding where I knew nobody, <laughs> and I had no choice but to chase her back to the hotel and spend three hours in the room crying with her. That should have been a good warning shot for me. <laughs> um, alas, it it wasn't um, because the same thing had to happen three or four more times for me to realize that there was there was some serious trouble. I, uh, one time we were at a restaurant on, on Melrose Avenue here in Los Angeles. Um, and again, I, she, she lives far away, so whenever she came up to visit me, she would have to stay, spend the night with me. So we're at this restaurant and somehow we're looking at another couple and we're being probably a little bit snarky. There was a, there was a woman who was much more attractive than the man she was with and we were debating whether the, the guy was a producer who just had a lot of money or something like that. And my girlfriend, out of nowhere, said pretty much that it was the exact same situation <laughs> uh, with, with us, that she was uh, much better looking than I was. And, um, and she kind of went on with it. I was, I, you know, for a second, I thought it was a joke, but she was really like being completely serious. And again, objectively, she was better looking than I was. You just, you just don't say that. So she was like twisting the knife and explaining to me why she was better looking than I was. And it was this really blatant attempt, attempt to hurt me. And I told her to be quiet. And she gets up, and this is during the appetizers, she gets up and she leaves the restaurant. She starts running down the street. <laughs> and I'm, whatever, I'm 27 years old. She's 31, I think. And I'm chasing her down the street. She, there's nowhere she could go. <laughs> she's, she's stuck because she can't get home. Um, but I, you know, chase her down the street and I get her in the car. And this happened at parties. This happened. It was, it was this incredible sign of emotional immaturity uh, that I put up with because I was lonely. Um, I was poor. She was beautiful. And 75% of the time, she was nice to me. It was just this 25% of the time that she was not. Finally, um, I took her to my mom's house. Um, this is in New York. Uh, it was for my mom's birthday. I flew my girlfriend out to New York. Uh, she'd never been. Uh, and I introduced her to my mom. And, and really within the first hour of being at my mom's place, as was our pattern, right? Everything could be really good. And then I would say something and she would get upset at me. And, I, and for the life of me, I, I never knew what it was that was going to trigger her. I'm not saying I'm perfect. I do. I do speak before I think, certainly. Um, I'm not sure if you could have a podcast if you have to spend too much time thinking. But I, I said something, which I, which I can't remember, and I could just see her turn into ice. She just glazed over, and I realized in that moment I lost her. And my mom was seeing the things that I saw. And um, I excused myself from the room, and I went downstairs, and I listened to my mom <laughs> talk to this woman. And... Again, this is not necessarily a story that makes anybody look good. And my mom said to my girlfriend, she goes, do you, do you love him? And she says, yes, yes, actually, I do. I, I, I love your son. And my mom says, then shut the fuck up. <laughs> I swear to God, shut the fuck up, my mom says. And girlfriend is sort of taken aback. She says, listen, I don't think my son is perfect. I know what his problems are, you know what his problems are. But if you're gonna be in a relationship with him, right, you largely just have to accept that this is the way he is instead of constantly icing him out and abandoning him and, and having these, these big, huge blowout 
fights with him, it's not a matter of right and wrong. It's if you can't accept that this is who he is, you should just break up with him today. So I'm not telling you to just be quiet for the sake of being quiet. I'm saying that if you can't accept him, you should go find another boyfriend that you can accept. Otherwise, you're both not going to be happy. Good wisdom for my mom, although you wouldn't expect anybody to talk to your girlfriend that way on the first time you meet her. My girlfriend <laughs> dumped me on the plane ride home from New York, <laughs> which I thought was wonderful uh, irony um, after my mom told her to dump me. Uh, it was ultimately the right call, of course. And uh, this remains the worst relationship that I ever had by far. I held on for four months to this roller coaster of a relationship, all for the wrong reasons. And I've never done anything like that again. I've almost made a career out of telling other people how to avoid such things. So after the break, we're going to talk about signs that you're in a bad relationship and what you can do about it. Uh, very specific things, and this is based on another relationship uh, that a friend of mine recently had where he gave me some great feedback on his girlfriend. Um, all of this could apply equally to men and women. I'm really excited to give it to you, so stick around after the break. This is Evan Mark Katz with the Love You Podcast. I'll talk to you in a second. Kath, dating coach for smart, strong, successful women with the Love You podcast, teaching everything you need to know about dating relationships and men from a man's point of view. We are talking about signs that you're in a bad relationship and how to avoid bad relationships in the future. And I want to begin this segment by telling a story about a close friend of mine who's just coming off a unfortunate relationship with a lovely woman. She's smart and she's fit and she's warm and she's funny. Um, but she's troubled. A uh, single mom with a uh, fractured family, um, sort of messed up relationship dynamics, uh, anxious attachment style. But she and my friend had a really good connection, a deep connection, great communication. So this is a, a, a case of, of two people who are indubitably good people um, who, already giving away the end of the story, couldn't find a way, way to make things work. And I, and I asked my friend afterwards what he saw in the relationship that, that could have been seen as uh, red flags to avoid. And this is what he, he told me. Um, first, he started with this bullet point, once a mess, always a mess. And that's a bit unfair to say um, for, for many reasons. And people are, are, are uh, incredibly capable of change and evolution. Um, I, I'm perfect example. I was a mess throughout my entire 20s and I was I was anxious and depressed and I was unemployed and I was making bad relationship choices and slowly but surely I you know I got my act together and 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 uh, you know uh, lead a, a happy stable life now. So the the once a mess always a, a mess is is a bit binary and simplistic, but there's definitely something to it. There are people and we all know who they are who have a lot of drama surrounding them. They're always in between jobs. Um, they're always talking about their uh, crazy exes or their messed up family situation or the person who stole money from them or, right? Lots and lots of drama. So um, when people feel like a whirlwind, right? They're a torno tornado that's sort of coming into your world. Um, you might want to take a look under the hood of that car and at least consider in the back of your brain that perhaps this person is the common denominator in their own life. This doesn't mean that they're a bad person or an evil person, but it means that they might just come with trouble. Sort of flip side of that that my friend pointed out is that these folks often present a very sanitized version of their troubles. Um, so they know that they have a, a crumbling house that is rotten in the foundation and that, that the whole place is a mess. But before you come over, they clean everything so it looks really nice from the outside, metaphorically speaking. And so you could, most people present pretty well. People know when they're a mess and they, they hide it. People show their best, their best side to you on the first date or the first month or the first couple months. And they do their best to, for lack of a better term, 
term hide their crazy when uh, things are new, when you're having sex, when you are going through the courtship process. Um, and so this isn't a call to necessarily be skeptical of that. Um, this is, if anything, um, building on the previous point about uh, once a mess, always a mess. Um, even people who have messy houses who try to clean them sometimes leave a few things out. And sometimes little stories can be writ large. You could pick up on something early in a relationship that's a big precursor uh, to something that may happen in the future. I think of a, a, a client of mine, uh, her name is Linda. This is many years ago. This is early in my career. And she, I helped her get a boyfriend within, within two or three weeks of working together. And she was smitten with him. And he was, he was 40 and he was retired and he was wealthy and he was charismatic and he was everything. And they were instantly in love and traveling and talking about a future. Um, but we had a 12 week contract to work together, even though I got her a boyfriend in two, two or three weeks. And so what do we talk about for the next uh, you know, eight, nine weeks? Well, we talked about what I asked her to look for in her boyfriend, things like this, right? What are the things that leave you feeling a little off balance? What are the things that make you scratch your head and say, hmm, what are the things that make you feel a little uncomfortable and unsure, no matter how in love, no matter how nice and generous and enthusiastic he's being right now? And sure enough, she said, you know, he, he sometimes dismisses my arguments. He's, he's, so, he's so confident, he's so opinionated, um, he's, a, he's kind of a right-wing guy, and I'm a little more, more left-wing liberal, and, and sometimes he just, I just feel dismissed or unheard. Um, he's, he's got a little bit of a temper, and he seems to override me sometimes, but that's the only problem I see. Sure enough, not surprisingly, one year later, I checked in with her, um, and she had just broken up with him. Uh, after a one-year relationship for the very reason that she noted when she first started dating him. Um, that little story got writ large over the long term. The third reason that my friend talked about being skeptical about a, a relationship, um, signs that things aren't working, he said relationships could feed you or they can drain you. And I think that's totally, totally true. Uh, one of my big love you uh, concepts is that relationships are easy, right? If your relationship isn't easy, it's not that good. It's one of my theories. And and um, a lot of people talk about, you know, you've got to work hard for your relationships. Relationships take work, 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 work. No, relationships take effort. You have to put in time. You have to be thoughtful of the person you're with, but it's not work. It's not like labor. It shouldn't keep you up at night. Oh my God, how do we work? How do we make this thing happen? So I'm not an energy person per se, but Let's just say that that uh, my, my friend's analogy is true. Relationships could either fill up your cup, oh, just being in this person's presence, coming home to this person, speaking with this person on the phone at night makes me feel better consistently. Or, man, every other interaction is like tiring where we talk about us and where it's going and there's these misunderstandings and I say this and, and he says this and I, that's that's a real drain. Pay attention to those drains. They don't necessarily get better over time. They're not things that you can work on. Um, good relationships, healthy relationships are ones where the puzzle pieces just fit really, really naturally. And they leave you feeling rejuvenated and understood and comforted and excited. Uh, they don't leave you feel, feeling tired, frustrated, and misunderstood as you know the relationship I spoke about earlier does and, and, and my friend's relationship did. Some people, I mean, feel actually a sense of dread when they're about to talk to their boyfriend or girlfriend. <laughs> dread is not a feeling you want to associate with your romantic relationships. Um, the next point is that some people, at certain points in their life, can't create happy relationships. Right? If, it, if, it, if it, again, if it feels like it's a, a whole ton of work, that's not a coincidence. That's a, that's a person who may have the best intentions, but is not in a place to really be there. Right? Maybe his mom is dying. Maybe he's going through a custody battle with his kids. Maybe he's losing his job or he's in a midlife crisis. Maybe he's drained from travel. Maybe he is, and again, these are not excuses to let someone off the hook emotionally for being a bad partner. Right? This, this, this means that you shouldn't be with that partner. Right? The, the timing in that person's life is such that the perfect woman could walk in the door and he would still not be able to have enough 
self-awareness, self-esteem, time, motivation to be uh, the, the kind of present, doting, attentive, self-aware boyfriend that you need. Sometimes people need to take in life because life circumstances are so great. And um, unfortunately, that's the reason that, that good people are like two ships passing in the, night, in the night. The timing is wrong. And at certain points in your life, you're not able, willing, or ready to have a real relationship. Um, another thing that my friend found draining in his relationship is that he, this is, this is sensitive, so I want to figure out how to say this. He had trouble with her inability to grasp reality. I call myself a reality-based dating coach, so this is something that's really close to home with me. But um, through this woman's trouble, she felt like a victim. And she was sort of a constant victim. She was a victim of her dad, she was a victim of her ex, and she was a victim of her employer. And, and, and gosh, you know, I, I could say there's, you know, there was definitely a time in my life that I felt the exact same way. I felt like forces were conspiring to keep me down and life was unfair and everybody was terrible. And that's only a, a piece of the puzzle. Um, in reality, we are the common denominators in our life. Right. In reality, we have a lot of control over our own, our own destiny um, to make the best of our circumstances. And, and my friend had trouble communicating with his partner because she didn't want to see herself as the common denominator. It was just easier to say that she was a victim. And when two people are not really on the same plane about how to fix problems in life, uh, it means that there's some, some sort of incongruency that's going to threaten the relationship. And then there's this last piece, and this comes from Jonah Lehrer. He wrote a, a book called uh, How We Decide. Um, and again, it, 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 it seems sort of glib to say this, but that, that idea is to trust your gut. Uh, your gut's really powerful. Um, we're all experts in pattern recognition, uh, whether we know it or not. When we see something that, that seems a little bit off, our guts often know it before our brains do. And in Lehrer's book, he talks about um, uh, two two brain systems essentially. There's your emotional brain and there's your rational brain and you need both of them to make decisions. So I just wanna read you this quote from his book, How We Decide, because I think it's so um, telling. He writes, if the emotional brain is the audience constantly sending out visceral signals about its likes and dislikes, then the prefrontal cortex is the smart executive, patiently monitoring emotional reactions and deciding which to take seriously. The rational brain can't silence emotions, but it can help figure out which ones to take seriously. Use your conscious mind to acquire all the information you need for making a decision, but don't try to analyze the information with your conscious mind. Instead, go on a holiday while your unconscious mind digests it. Whatever your intuition tells you is almost certainly going to be the best choice. As long as someone has sufficient experience in that domain, he shouldn't spend too much time consciously contemplating the alternatives. The hardest calls are the ones that require the most feeling. And so I reiterate, even though I try to do a lot of cerebral fact-based based stuff as a dating coach, there's nothing that's more important than listening to that that gut of yours and saying, do I feel safe? Do I feel heard? Do I feel comfortable? Can I feel like I could be myself around this person? Do I trust this person? Those are gut feelings. They're not coming from up here, right? So bad relationships are usually where strangely, even though we may be in love, we ignore our gut feeling. Something's really wrong here, right? And if you feel something's really wrong here, there's very little incentive to continue to proceed down that path, waiting for the inevitable crash, right? Like so many of us do. I've just cited stories of, of me and my best friend who did the exact same thing. So in saying that, I'm not telling you to look for only perfect people. Right? We're talking about signs of bad relationship and I talk about baggage and people saying things that make you uncomfortable. Listen, it's not about looking for perfect people. It's really more about avoiding getting on a sinking ship. If you get on a sinking ship, you're not really allowed to complain that it's sinking. So when you choose to date someone whose life is in disarray, as I did when I was dating someone who was unemployed and living with her mom, um, uh, as my friend did. Uh, his, his girlfriend was uh, unemployed at the time and he, he had her virtually move in with him um, because she had nowhere to turn. This is early in the relationship. When you're, when you're taking on someone who just is not in a good place in life, um, it's, there's, this, there's this part of you that really wants to save someone. It's based on their kindness and their potential and your chemistry. It's not your job to save anybody. It's really not. This isn't your, your son. 
right? Um, it, it, I don't want to sound like I'm, 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 I'm callous, but when you have to rehabilitate someone just to be on an equal playing field with you, you don't find yourself in an equal relationship. Um, it, you're sort of willfully taking on some a, a project, and your partner, your man, should not be your project. He should be your, your equal partner. So staying away from sinking ships might mean one thing. It might mean you're single for a longer period of time, and that's not a bad thing. Right? Much rather you be single and open to meeting someone who does have his act together than to stay with someone who requires so much maintenance, so much up and down, who is such an energy and time drain where you keep on getting your cup drained instead of refilled by his presence. The important takeaway, one of the important takeaways I would hope you get from this podcast, is that I don't want you to mistake connection, passion, or even love for, you know, attachment or enduring love. Right? The, the, the feeling is very different than what marriage actually looks like. Right? Someone who leads a, a calm, stable life, that's not boring. Someone who leads a really exciting life because they're constantly losing their job and getting into fights with people, they may be fascinating to talk to because of all their drama. That's not a stable situation that you want to insert yourself in. So if your relationship has a lot of turmoil, it's the kind of relationship that is certainly worth reconsidering. And you're probably not going to be very happy with it, right? whether it's with your friends, with your family, or with the, your significant other. You deserve someone who could provide a, an anchor and a foundation for you, and that's rarely to be found on a sinking ship. So I want to thank you, as always, for joining me here on the Love You podcast. It is my pleasure to be your host. My name is Evan Marquez. The next episode, I'm going to talk about how to stop men from walking all over you. You're going to want to tune in. If you enjoy this podcast, please click subscribe. Um, follow me on Facebook and Twitter. Most importantly, go to www.evanmarkkatz.com. Give me your name and email address, and I will send you free dating and relationship advice until you don't need any more dating and relationship advice. Thank you so much for your time. I'll see you again next week. Okay.